so in part one, so I guess the main lesson or takeaway uh, was uh, replace um, inductive equality with path P. Uh, and uh, yeah, everything is great. So uh, yeah, so, so really this kind of idea of, of using the heterogeneous path um, instead of the, the homogeneous path is, uh, is uh, really nice and kind of easily overlooked. So even long before we get to like um, computational univalence and the higher inductive types and so on, we already reaped a lot of benefits. So uh, um, we get fun next. Uh, and as I guess all of you saw, it's as easy to prove it for dependent functions as for non-dependent functions. And uh, a lot of other things uh, uh, get really nice with path P, like equality and sigma types, um, even before you get to uh, all the univalent and, and hot stuff that we do in, in cubicle type theory. Okay, uh, so that was lesson from part one. Um, now, uh, well, <clears throat> So everything uh, is kind of great, uh, but uh, so far we can't really compose paths. So you remember if you, you saw like or concatenate paths. So the way you would do that is use, use path induction in hot and then um, you concatenate paths. So with what we've seen so far, we can't concatenate paths. So everything isn't super great yet, but uh, I'm gonna talk about this notion of cubicle transport. Um, homogeneous composition, which will let us do this and much, much more. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, cubicle transport uh, is almost, well, okay, let me just, well, it's almost like transport, but a bit more primitive. I'll show you in one second what I mean. Um, so I think I can write this now. So what? Uh, so when I say transport in this talk, I'm talking about this kind of more uh, this kind of simpler version of, of transport when you when you're not really transporting between uh, uh, like different fibers uh, of a vibration, but rather we just start with a with a path and you turn it into a function um, from A to B. So that's what we talk about when we talk about cubicle transport. So there's a little bit of mismatch in terminology uh, with respect to hot, um, but uh, this is what we call things. So when I say transport, it's just turn a path into a function. So how do we do that? Well, we have a B and an X and uh, we need to produce a B. And for this, there's another uh, built-in thing. Uh, let me just type it all. Called transp and transp. Um, so uh, transp uh, is another built in of cubicle agla. And uh, yeah, it's essentially there to let us define transport. Um, Yep, and you see it looks almost like transport, uh, except I had to eat to expand the path. Uh, so I can't write this because then Agda gets mad at me. So I have to eat to expand it for technical reasons, which I won't go into. Uh, but, uh, and then I had to give it uh, this, um, an I zero here, which is kind of a weird argument or like an interval argument to transpend them, the X. Um, so, um, before uh, I say more about transp, uh, for now, just accept that it's there and uh, that we have this transport. And now I'm going to show how to get uh, uh, cubicle, um, hot transport. Um, so yeah, we call hot transport subst in cubicle world. So given a family of types B, and x and y and t, we get a function from bx, whoops, and 
path from x to y, we get a function from bx to by. So this is the form of uh, transport that you saw uh, um, And what did I screw up? Error. <laughs> what? Parse error. What have I done? <laughs> One second. Okay. Hmm. Let me just comment out the type. That's your oh. beyond us. Oh. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, okay, so let's. Uh, so now I can show you why, like, explain why why this cubicle transport is more primitive than the transport of hot, uh, because we can define what we call subs, which you, which is the same as hot transport using it. So we just want to transport, and then the first argument is uh, a path. So we lambda abstract over i, and then we want a path. Uh, between b of x and b of y. And we have a path from uh, x to y, so we can just write b and then pi. And then uh, we need something in bx, which is I call px. Boom. So using this cubicle transport, we get the whole transport for subs, as we call it. So it's kind of a more primitive operation, um, which is a bit more natural to add uh, to cubicle type theory. So to explain like why it's more natural and so on, I won't try to do that, but just trust me. Um, if I may ask a quick question, the yes. transport uh, defined uh, above, is it uh, basically the hot transport uh, along the identity type family? Yeah, basically, yes. Okay, so basically what uh, the hot book uh, calls uh, id to equive if you if you want. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, the function. Yeah, I don't know. Is that what? Oh, yeah. That's what the hot call. Yeah, it was so long ago. I read the hot book. I don't remember what it calls things. But yes, uh, this is that thing. Okay. And there you would define it by j, and you map. Uh, yeah, yeah. You return the identity function. Yes. For the sake of completeness, could you please deduce the type of transp? Yes, that was the next thing I was going to do. Uh -huh. So what is transp? So transp, there's this built-in thing that takes an A, uh, which is a line. Oops, can I type? Yes, I can type. A uh, line of types, some arm element R in the interval, and um, it gives us a function from um, a i zero to a i one. So, okay, so uh, um, so there are some technical uh, technical conditions for this to type check, and I don't think I want to go into that now. But uh, see documentation. Essentially, this a has to be constant whenever this r is is one. Um, yeah, but this is the explained documentation. I don't want to go into it because it's a bit like working directly with transp is something that power users do. But uh, when you use the library, you don't really have to look under the hood because we have transport, we have transport inverse, the fact that they form an equivalence and so on, all of that is already proved. So a normal user don't really have to work directly with transp. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, extra this might be worth saying extra computation rule uh, so transp a i1 of x is equal to x so this r uh, argument let's just kind of control when this transp is the identity function um, which for technical reasons is very useful but like i said like if you're just want to play around with the library you don't really have to um yeah, work directly with transfer of them. And then I'm just gonna look at the next page. Okay. Um, but uh, let me very quickly, so, uh, so this, uh, so this is the computation rule. Uh, let's just prove uh, various nice things. 
Okay, so let me just show one such nice thing. So let's say I want to transport. Uh, along ref x along ref of so in hot this would be proved by refl right because this transport with what someone pointed out is what's called into a quib i think in the hot book and it's just defined by path induction on on uh, yeah, what do we call the argument P? But uh, here it reduces to something else. Um, and well, I can try to fill it with raffle, but Agda will complain. So let me ask Agda to normalize the gold for us. And then we see that this thing reduces to transp. Well, uh, lambda i a. So this is really just a constant uh, line in a. Or, a constant line which is always a and then this i0 and x okay so how could one prove uh, that these two weird things are equal well the key is really this extra computation rule that transp at i1 is their identity function so we're constructing a path so i do that and then i just write transp sorry how is that computation rule well typed yeah, let me explain that in one second when I type this. Yes, okay. So if we trust that this uh, computation rule is well typed, um, then um, we trust that this uh, actually proves the thing we want because uh, this transport reduces this with i0. Um, so if you give it i, so when i is 0, it's the left-hand side, and when i is 1, uh, this computation rule will trigger and we'll just get X out. So having this extra computation rule is there for like for this kind of technical things where we need to be able to prove properties about transp, uh, which don't hold definitionally uh, because it's not defined by induction, but rather, uh, yeah, by, this is like a primitive thing. So, uh, so this is uh, well-typed because of, uh, the technical conditions um, that I don't really want to go into too much. But essentially, what they say is that this this a this line, whenever this r is one, so in this case it is one. Uh, this is the constant uh, constant line. Like it doesn't vary as long as r is one. It's like the idea. So then it's AI zero will be definitionally the same as AI one. So it's fine. Um, and um, how to get Agda to handle these things is explained in the documentation. But uh, yeah, so there's this technical side condition on this rule, which says that uh, when R is one, this uh, is these two things are the same. But uh, let's not get too bogged down in these technical details. I just wanted to show that like we have this more general form of transport called transp, which lets us prove various things. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, for a normal user, um, all of these things like transport refl is proved in the library. So you don't really have to look at how it's proved. So, but I wanted to mention it so that, uh, because it will pop up. Um, okay, very good. Um, Yes. So uh, now uh, with uh, transport, uh, we can prove uh, J. So that's kind of an important point. So we add this kind of transp operation, which lets us define transport. And with the structure that we have on the interval, we can actually now prove path induction. Um, and I have the proof in the notes, but I don't think I want to show it because in the end, um, uh, we don't want to use it. So uh, when formalizing things cubically, one almost never uses J. So the fact that we can prove J is nice because we know that this, this notion of path equality that we've defined, it coincides with the normal notion of equality that we all know and love from, from Hot and, and Martin Left Type Theory. But in the end, the induction principle um, 
doesn't really help us much when we're doing cubical proofs. So, so we proved all of these things in the exercises without using J a single time. And there's yeah a lot of things that you can do much more directly without applying J. So you kind of have to uh, almost forget about J and uh, do things uh, cubically. So you have to embrace the cubes to really kind of reap all the benefits uh, from uh, from cubical type theory. So I'm just going to say C notes and I'm not going to prove it. Um, okay, but uh, I wanted to say it. Um, and thus, yes. can we see this as a uh, reasoning with congruence and uh, dependent congruence, I mean, heterogeneous congruences instead of using an elimination principle then? Is it the same kind of difference that? Uh, so in mm -hmm. Coq, for example, you have this, uh, this phenomenon that if you use uh, equality, the, the standard identity type, you can eliminate it in any context, so it's very, you can get short proofs from that. But once you work with setoids, you have to use congruence rules everywhere. And we have this machinery to infer congruence rules for everything. But in cubical, you get the second kind, you're working with congruence, but everything is congruent by, by fiat, by, already primitively congruent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good analogy. Um, yeah, and then I, I Yes. Yeah, continue if you. Uh, yeah, I might be saying what you're going to ask about, <laughs> but uh, the one caveat. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, how do you, for example, prove stuff like you know, associativity of concatenation of paths or like uh, you know stuff like that without J? Ah, oh, yeah. So I'm going to show you very soon. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm going to get there. So, um, yep, yeah, um, yes, but I want to first say this. So, so we can prove J, but like we saw, like transport along REFL isn't definitionally the identity of function, right? So uh, J applied to REFL isn't definitionally uh, the identity. So, uh, only up to a path. So this is kind of another reason why you don't want to use J when working cubically because uh, you don't have the computation rules strictly, but only up to a path. And this complicates your life a lot if you use it a lot. So, um, yeah. But this is also, I mean, maybe not so surprising because equality isn't inductively defined. So why should J compute in any special way on REFL. That's kind of, uh, yeah. yeah, the way I see it these days. So, uh, yep, okay. So now, um, I think it was Valerie who asked now. So, uh, so how do we uh, concatenate paths without J? I guess that's the question everybody's asking themselves. And it turns out, uh, Another primitive is the answer. And this is called uh, homogeneous composition, H comp. So we have this yet another primitive, so not just trans, but also what we call H comp for homogeneous composition, which lets us directly concatenate paths or cubes or hypercubes. Uh, it's kind of it's an operator that takes an n-dimensional cubes and then replace some sides of this cube. So it's really um, embracing kind of the higher dimensionality of, of cubical type theory and incorporating it into one, uh, one operator. Um, and now, uh, yeah, one might wonder like, how do you even <laughs> write an operator which takes in arbitrary high dimensional cubes and glue them together? Well, uh, uh, there's a lot of machinery for doing that. and. Uh, this machinery makes cubical type theory a little bit complicated, I guess. But in the end, when you're using it, it's uh, it's uh, quite fun because you can kind of draw a picture and then you type it into the computer and it type checks. Like you don't have to do everything by J, which is kind of, I don't know, very syntactic and not very geometric, I would say. Uh, I might be, uh, uh, yeah, whatever. So it's kind of nice. You can work on paper, um, drawing pictures, and then you uh, 
use this H comp operator to kind of turn it into something syntactic and formal, and then add the type checks that you've glued everything together in the right way on paper. Sounds very abstract, but let me show you an example. So let's define uh, composition of paths or concatenation of paths. Um, just check my timer. Okay, I'm doing better this, this hour, I guess. Uh, now that we all uh, know how to read Agda code, it's going a bit faster. Okay, so, so what I want to do is I want to take a path P uh, from X to Y and a path uh, Q from Y to Z, and I want to glue them together or compose them. So because we're constructing a path, I'm gonna um, introduce an I, like always. So now we want something in A with this boundary, okay? And for this, I'm gonna use this hcomp operator. Um, and I'm just gonna use Agda to refine. Agda is happy. Um, and what I'm gonna do is, okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to copy paste a picture from my uh, notes down here. One second. Okay, where was I? Wait, I can jump to the door. Okay, whoop, whoop, whoop. Okay, so what? Okay, let's ignore all of this junk. Um, so what do we want to do? Um, so like I said, I want to draw a picture and then I want to turn it into something formal. So. Um, this HCOMP operator essentially lets us compose um, cubes and lines in a nice way, uh, as long as they match up, of course. Um, but you gotta do it in kind of a, a cubicle way. Um, so you wanna compose P with Q, but then we have to do it with a cube shape, or in this case, a square shape, because it's just two things we're composing that are lines. Um, um, okay, so we need to make this kind of picture with an open kind of um, square with one side is missing. And then the H comp operator, oh, okay, my, uh, this would have been nicer on board, but you can kind of picture what I'm. So then the H comp operator will give us kind of the, the top of this square, which that will then be a, a line from X to Z, uh, where we kind of compose refl with P and Q. Okay, so let me now uh, give you the syntax for this. So the first argument to HCOMP is very scary. And um, well, it looks very scary. Um, and for now, I'm going to ignore it and just give the second argument. Ah, that's nice. It's just an A. So this, the second argument uh, is the, the base of this square, PI like the bottom here. So I'm just gonna give that. And then Agda will have some more information here, which will, uh, well, it's still kind of scary, but uh, yeah. Um, so here we need to specify now the sides of these things. It's like this part of this picture. Uh, so we want some kind of way of specifying a, a partially, partially given, uh, square, essentially the two sides of a square. And that's what this funny function type is doing. So we have a, a dimension, which is the dimension going up in the picture. That's the first one. And then we need uh, some kind of strange argument, which I will uh, say too much about right now, but uh, let me just refine this for us and call the dimension going up J and then I did this. And now here is one place where Agda, it would have been nice if Agda would type this for me, but uh, Agda doesn't do that, so I have to type things myself, and I know what to type, so it's much easier. Um, if you're a beginner, this probably looks completely scary, um, but uh, let me explain it. Okay, so now what do we want to do? So here we are giving kind of the size of this, this uh, square. And when i is zero, so 
this side here, like this here, going up and down there. And we want to put X. So this we can just do. Oh, I have to get it in scope, sorry. So we just want to put that. And then on the right hand side, we want to put QJ. So when I is one, um, we put QJ and bam. Agda is happy. We have turned this funny looking picture into some a piece of syntax. And uh, now you might think, uh, whoa, what the heck happened? It was so much easier to use path induction. Um, but luckily, um, most forms of like, composition that you want and all the laws that uh, it has to satisfy, we've already formalized for you. So when you use the library, you don't really have to use hcomp uh, unless you're a power user. So, but I felt I should still show you, like there's this yet another primitive, which a beginner shouldn't really have to worry about, but it's there to let us compose paths without using J. Uh, um, actually, my question was how to do you prove that this expression is associative without using J? That this is associative. associative. Yeah. So then you need to construct a, a square, which relates uh, three, uh, two compaths to two other compaths where you shuffle things around. And to do that, you compute the lid of an open cube, so to say. Um, yeah, it seems using J is easier actually, I don't know. Yeah, um, that's uh, like, yeah, so for like the groupoid laws, um using j is probably easier but then once you start working with like uh heterogeneous paths and also higher inductive types it starts getting easier to using this h comp uh, yeah i think that sometimes it is uh, in this yeah. case and sometimes it is uh, j just yeah. depends yeah exactly yes so, but luckily we've proved all the group orders you might want uh, so uh, you don't have to do it yourself. I guess I can show you what they look like uh, now that we're talking about it very quickly in case someone is curious. Um, and they're going to look scary. Uh, can I make this colorful? Uh, where is well, here's the proof of associativity, which doesn't look very scary. So compass is written like this, but then it uses compass filler and compass filler prime, which is uh, using double compass filler and so on and so forth. Uh, so it does get kind of complicated, I agree. Um, yeah, I don't think I should have showed that. But uh, for like a normal user, you don't really have to look under the hood. You just use this as a primitive uh, operation. Um, yep. Good. What happens if you normalize a concatenation? Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Oops, sorry. My phone tells me I should move on to the next topic, but uh, let me try something. Well, okay. I don't have to show it. I can just say. So this is a normal form. Like HComp is a normal form. Uh, if, if A is a variable, this is a normal form. So it won't reduce further. Right. Yeah. But if you have like H comp in a pi type, that will normalize. So H comp under the hood has some reduction rules depending on which type the, the composition is done in. So, uh, but that's, uh, uh, yeah, knowledge for uh, expert users of uh, the system, I guess. But uh, we do talk a bit about how this kind of both H comp and trans. They reduce differently for different types. And in the cubicle like paper, which um, Mathieu mentioned, we actually explained this in a way which I don't think is too uh, scary. But uh, it's also explained in the CCHM paper. But there, I think uh, maybe the presentation isn't as uh, pedagogical. But like for a normal user, you don't really have to think about this uh, before you start doing advanced stuff. Um, so. Uh, but yes, good. Um, all right, very good. Okay, so that was my alarm, which said I should be done with part two now. So let's see. So we talked about cubicle transport. I showed that South is a special case. I said I said you can get path induction from 
from it. Uh, talks about edge comp and binary composition. Yeah, okay, so I covered what I wanted to cover. So let me jump to part three now. Okay, I, I have to do something, sorry. I should have prepared this slightly better. One second. I want my, oops. Oh yeah, here was a nice point. Maybe I should say it before. Yeah, so I said beginners uh, don't have to read, write hcomp to prove things. And we have a lot of basic lemmas. Also, you can write this kind of equational reasoning just like you would in, in normal Agda. You can write, uh, um, yeah, in cubicle Agda. So like this path here, we want a path from R prime to R double prime, whatever that is, doesn't really matter. We do it with a chain of rewrites like this and you state like what's happening. So here we multiply by one, then we expand this and yada, yada, yada. So this kind of proofs, you can write just as fine uh, in cubicle like that. And under the hood, they will uh, be big H comps, but for a user, you don't really have to see that unless you start normalizing your paths. Okay, good, right. Um, okay. Uh, okay, maybe before I jump to part three, are there any um, questions about part two? Or are people okay with what I'm saying so far? Well, uh, so uh, H comp also have competition rules like TRANSP, yes. And you can look at the cubicle like the paper to see some of them. Okay, but uh, yeah. All right, let me just jump to part three. So part three, uh, so now we're finally getting to univalence. Now we know that we can compose paths using uh, HCOMP. We can get J and other cool things from, from the trans primitive. Um, so now our uh, path type behaves like the identity type, um, which is nice. But we also want uh, univalence, of course. And we want univalence in such a way that it's not that as an axiom, but rather uh, in a way that actually uh, that you can compute with. Whoop. And now port three, here we go. Um, okay. So now I'm importing cubicle core dot glue. And this glue thing is what lets us prove univalence. And it was, I guess, the main innovation in the cubicle, uh, the CCHM paper. And it's very complicated and you don't really have to know much about it either. So, but it's good to know that it's there. Now we need equivalences. So these are just maps with contractible fibers, as we've seen before. And isomorphism, that's just uh, two functions that cancel each other um, and they can be uh, corrected to an equivalence. Okay, so that's what I'm importing from the library. And then I'm importing the two files I wrote before, um, just to have all the stuff we talked about. Okay, so, so univalence, so one way of stating is that equivalence of types is uh, equivalent to uh, well, identity. Let's, let's write ID here not to be confusing. So this is kind of one way of stating the, the form of the univalence axiom that we've been working with uh, this week. Um, so now we want to do this, but with, uh, ah, shit, sorry, with this instead, with past instead. Okay, so uh, we want something like this. Um, so having an equivalence means that we have functions both ways that cancel and it, uh, it turns out that you uh, only need um, some kind of ua from with a computation rule okay um, the computation rule. Okay, I don't know if anyone talked about this, but uh, this actually says that whenever you have a uh, C make B transporting 
mm, along ua of e okay then you need an element x in a uh, this extracts the first component of your uh, equivalence so the function and applies it so with this two uh, you get univalence and maybe andre mentioned this maybe Someone else mentioned it, maybe no one mentioned it. Uh, I'm saying it now and uh, to prove it uh, uh, for now, you just have to trust me, but uh, it's kind of a nice, nice exercise to try to prove that this give a full univalence. It's also proved in the hot book, I think. So, so um, and this is, this is the approach we take here um, in cubicle Agda really, because um, defining this map is, uh, Kind of the useful direction when you want to use univalence um, because what you often want to do is you have some equivalence of types and you just want to turn it into a path um, turning a path into an equivalence is a lot less fun and a lot less common so this is really what you want so it's nice if this is the primitive that you give i think and then well you wanted to satisfy this computation rule uh, in order to be equivalent to the normal formulation of univalence. Um, okay, so let me do this now. All right, let me prove it. So we're given E, oop, uh, which is an equivalence between A and B, and we want to construct a path. As always, we um, abstract over an i, and now we need some kind of line, which the left end point is a and the right end point is b. And this is exactly what these glue types that I mentioned give you. Um, oh no, I need to give these names. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need both a and b, so I'm gonna do this like this. So glue is a bit like, um, for now, Sorry, Ida shows very bad messages um, when you have incomplete terms sometimes. But so what gluing does is really it takes a type and then um, it glues on other types along equivalences. So it's a bit like age comp, but uh, uh, instead of gluing or concatenating paths, it's really concatenating equivalences uh, onto your, your type. Uh, and that's what we want to do here. And I'm just going to write the, the term and we're all going to be happy, I guess. Or, uh, you'll have to trust me that it works. Come on, e. Oops, sorry. Oops. Okay, so what did I do? I'm going to put the parentheses here because it's hard to read. So essentially, um, I take my type B and I glue on, uh, when I is zero, I glue on A along the equivalence E. When I is one, I glue on B itself with the identity equivalence. So this is a bit like this H comp. We need to put the reflexivity or the identity equivalence on one side to get like a open square shape if you draw this thing. Um, because that's what uh, uh, cubicle like that likes squares and cubes and stuff. All right, All so, right. so, so yeah. glue basically interpolate between these two values almost using equivalences. Um, yes, so the, I don't, yeah, so like the idea is, well, I don't know. I guess I say yeah, yes, but uh, was there more of, to the question? Like, so glue type really lets us turn an equivalence into a path by gluing the equivalence onto onto a type. Um, I don't know if this intuition is very helpful, but um, that's how I think about it. So it's, it's kind of what lets you turn an equivalence into a path. That's really the, the takeaway here. And then how it works under the hood is uh, complicated and explained in detail in various places. But, but for a normal user, once again, like 
I always just use the UA constant. I very rarely unfold it. So I got Agda do that and compute things for me, but uh, I very rarely do things with glue types directly. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess mastering glue types is like the next next level of power user uh, after mastering HCOMP, maybe two levels up. Uh, it's, uh, they're a bit harder to work with, but luckily you don't really have to do that because we just have the UA constant and we use it everywhere and it reduces the way we want. So I said we needed this and then we needed this. So let me just group it. Aha. Okay. So now we just have to prove this constant. And then we got it with nice colors. And so what we can do is ask Agda to normalize the goal for us. Aha. This looks like something we saw before, right? So we have a transp with a constant family of types, I0, okay and uh, first ex. So uh, we're almost done. We're only uh, transport refl away. Uh, and boom, the proof is done. So it would have been nice, I guess, if this would have been uh, proved by refl. But once again, uh, for very technical reasons, uh, well, Maybe not once again, but for very technical reasons, it's not proved by REFL. Um, you have to give a tiny little proof, uh, just one of these trivial transports or transps that I showed you before. But I mean, it's fine for full univalence or the normal formulation of univalence is sufficient that this is a path. This doesn't have to be a definition of equality. And also, if you instantiate this with like closed types, I don't know, uh, yeah, I don't know, bool bool equals bool, uh, like the, the fact that uh, swapping booleans is an equivalence, then this would actually reduce um, the, way, the way you want. Okay, so. Can I quickly ask a question? So one of the nice things about cubicle type theory is that you have this canonicity property, right? So if I transport along univalence in the natural numbers, for example, I mean, the fact that you still had to prove this, doesn't that mean the univalence term is still not computing exactly? No, because this, these, are, these are variables. So canonicity says that any closed term of type natural number is equal to a numeral, right? But this is definitely not a closed term, right? I mean, it depends on E, A, B, X, so. So that's not a problem here. So what, what Kanonicity really says is once you instantiate everything, like, and uh, these two sides are uh, natural numbers, then everything will reduce to numerals. Right, is it clear? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Kanonicity is really a, a statement about uh, closed terms. And for open terms uh, that depend on variables, you need to look at normalization and this is substantially harder but like i mentioned there was recently a paper uh, at Lix project in computer science this year which uh, proves normalization for a related uh, cubicle type theory so uh, but yeah but kind of canonicity is also hard to prove uh, i'm not saying that canonicity is trivial this uh, took many years for very smart people to prove and uh, and now it's also been extended to normalization after quite a few more years. So uh, anyway, um, good. So, so the fact that this is improved by REFL is not a problem for uh, canonicity. That was my point. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then the normalization result will say something like this, this trams, transps that don't reduce away their, their normal forms. Uh, just like if you apply a variable to five, it's also a normal form or a neutral so this will be neutrals sorry not normal forms anyway i'm uh, this is irrelevant to what i'm wanting to show now uh, what time is it okay good 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 we're good on time kind of okay so let me uh, uh, compute with ua oops uh, so let me Introduce the booleans. Okay, so what are the booleans? Well, they're false and they're true. 
or they're true. So we have two constructors for true in either you can write them on the same line like this with space in between. Um, but it's two distinct constructors. And let me just um, quickly prove uh, that bool uh, is equivalent to bool by just swapping the booleans, uh, the swapping false of true. I think this might have been an exercise that you did uh, in Cock the other day. Sorry. Um, okay, so now I'm going to show another cool thing in Agda is whenever you have an inductively defined type like this with many constructors uh, and you want to pattern match on it. So in, in Cock, you would write induction or, uh, yeah, probably induction. But here I want to just like case split on this X. I press uh, oops. Control C, Control C. So you saw that for sigma types before, but it also works for, for bool. And then Agda generates uh, two clauses for me automatically. Very cool. And then I can just type in the cases I want. Okay. So, uh, so CC equals case split. In Agda, very, 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 very useful command uh, that you use all the time once you start working with inductive types. So let me just quickly prove that bool is equal to bool uh, by applying UA to uh, something. Uh -huh. So UA expects an equivalence uh, uh, between bool and bool. And we have a very useful lemma, which is iso to equiv, um, which essentially says whenever you have an isomorphism, so two functions that cancel each other, you get an equivalence. So, I use it all the time, and then now I need to give an isomorphism. So this is just a, a record, an inductive type, with four fields. And the fields, in this case, is going to be the not equivalence. So now we need to prove that for all b in bool, not not of b is b. So let me just take this out, and I don't know, what should I call this? Not cancel. So how do you prove this? Well, once again, by pattern matching on B using control CC, so case splitting. Uh, Agda, okay, Agda normalized not, not to false for me and it produces the false. So this is raffle, this is raffle. And then I can put not cancel here. Okay, so now we have the path from bool to bool. Now let's use it to do something fun. Um, well, I can just see if I press Control C, Control N, I can give an uh, a term for egg that will normalize for me. So let's say we transport along this path and we transport true. Um, this reduces to false, um, and in hot uh, this wouldn't produce. Uh, to anything because transporting in UA is stuck because Cock doesn't know how to, uh, Hot doesn't know how to reduce transports in, in UA. So you would have to manually apply this, this computation rule and then things will reduce. But you probably saw if you do the exercise with the, where you prove that H set is not a set, you probably saw that it gets kind of annoying applying this computation rules manually. And uh, one of the exercises today is to redo this proof, but cubically. And then uh, you'll see that it's kind of nice to have things compute for you. Because then, like all of these rewrites that you have to do manually, suddenly Agda is doing them for you. And that's uh, that's great. Uh, yeah. So having canonicity in a type theory like this is not just about uh, like making type theory is happy is really also about making users of the type theory happy, I think, because it gets very annoying to, to compute things by hand by rewriting. Um, it's fun for a while, but uh, after a while it gets kind of old. So it's nice to have a system that does the work for you. Okay, that was my uh, little rant about um, why it's great to have canonicity also for for using a proof assistant. Um, okay.
Mm, then I had an example with integers, but I think you all believe me that uh, this actually worked with the successor function, that it's an equivalence and you can transport back and forth along it. So that you can look at in the notes. And now, uh, how are we doing on time? Good, I have nine minutes until I should quit for a break. So what was, did I say? So I talked about univariance from these two things. I talked about transporting with UA. And now I'm going to talk a bit about this structure identity principle. Okay, well. Commonly referred to as the SIP, SIP. Okay. Um, so you probably all heard this thing that, thing that univalence kind of, uh, univalence lets you identify equivalent types, but this also kind of lifts to structure types. So types with structures, like, I don't know, monoid structures. If you have a monoid structure on a, a type, then this type is equivalent to another type, then you automatically get the monoid structure on this other type. Uh, and so on. And this is quite useful for uh, like generic programming and, and whatnot. Uh, kind of a useful, like it's it's a principle that you use a lot in math because a lot of people identify things up to equivalence, also things with structure. But also when you're programming, it's very useful to uh, uh, be able to automatically transport programs and proofs between the equivalent structure types. Look. Okay. Mm. So let me show you this a bit in action. So first I'm gonna do a poor man's SIP, which sounds kind of sad, but it's uh, actually quite useful and it's very, very easy to do. So I think I will have time to do it all in just a few minutes. Um, so what is the structure on a type to start with? So I said, for example, monoid is a structure. So being a monoid, which just says you have a like a neutral element and a binary operator, yes, uh, satisfying certain axioms. That's a structure you can package it up as a function from type L to type L prime. So the thing I claim just now is that whenever I have some structure and an equivalence between A and B. I get a function from S of A to S of B. Uh, what do I call it? Oh, X, I'm out of names. Okay, so, so for example, if I have a monoid on A, so let's make this very concrete. Let's say I have a monoid on unary numbers. I know that a unary representation of numbers is equivalent to a binary representation. Then I automatically get the monoid structure on the, the binary numbers without having to define any operators or anything. I get everything for free. So uh, I'm going to show you that very quickly. So first of all, how do I prove this? Well, uh, this is kind of a nice use case of this uh, subst or uh, what we knew as uh, um, as hot transport. Uh, or cubicle subst. So we want to, like, UA of E gives us a path between A and B, and we want to get a function from S of A to S of B. So we just subst S, UA, A, E, and boom. So that's very easy to get, um, and things will compute nicely. Um, so let me very quickly do this uh, binary number example, and then I'll be done. Okay. Wait. Sorry, let me just <laughs> copy paste. I don't know why I've started typing everything. Okay, because it's a kind of a long import because I have to rename things so that they work nicely. But anyway, so bin nut is just binary numbers, essentially lists of uh, booleans, and nut is just uh, the piano numbers, so zero and successor. And we've already proved that uh, these two are equivalent, and so on. So I'm just gonna use all the stuff from the library, but now I'll show you how you can combine it with substequiv to transport some, some structure between the two types. So to use substequiv, I need to define some structure. So let's, oh man, let's define a T. Uh -huh. 
and what structure do I want to use? So I'm doing like very poor man's, well, I guess this is some magma or something. I have to see what I have. So let's say we have a binary operator X uh, plus, well, sorry, it's getting late here in my brain. And uh, let's, uh, with the fact that it's associative. Okay, so is this a magma? Maybe, I never remember. I think it's just, I think it's a magma. You have a binary operator that is associative and nothing else. Um, um, okay, but I mean, you can easily imagine scaling this up to whatever complex structure you want. Uh, on X, like uh, having multiple operators that interact in complex ways, uh, right? Um, but I'm doing this because I have time to type it. Um, okay. So first, uh, okay, so let's say I have uh, this on, this structure on N. The natural numbers, the, the, the what do you call it? piano numbers. So I need to give an operator. Here we have plus. And I have already proved that plus is associative. Okay, so we have an instance of this magma structure on the natural numbers already proved. Now I want to transfer it over to the binary numbers. Maybe I should have called it magma now that I'm thinking of it. But yeah. So then I use substequib, okay, uh, in T. Then I want an equivalence between uh, unary and binary numbers, and this I called, this is already in the library. And there we go. And then uh, this I just also took from the library. Okay. So now we have this magma structure on binary numbers. And uh, then, uh, yeah, I can, I don't know. show you that it actually computes. Oops. Well, sorry. So I can just extract the operator and then uh, I forgot what the constructors on bin are. No. Okay. Why can't I jump to the definition? Sorry, I forgot what the constructor are. Okay. But okay, let's normalize something. Uh, I have to. Oh God, what have I done? Sorry. Uh, well, do I have a number here? Ah, okay. So plus one, okay, that's one in binary. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, I should have prepared this. I'm freestyling a bit now, just so you know. But oh, uh, okay, shit, I should stop. Uh -huh, that's the name of the constructor. Okay, I don't know what's going wrong, but uh, it should work. Okay, well, that was annoying, but uh, you can't get it to work. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Why is it? Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, sorry. Okay, let's just add zero with zero. <laughs> Uh, I was using the we have multiple versions of the binary numbers and I forgot uh, that I used this one. Okay, so now I computed zero plus zero is zero, which seems kind of trivial, but uh, there's quite a lot of stuff going on here. So, uh, and you can use it for a lot more fun stuff. Um, Nersh, yes. what happens if you evaluate just the operation without ah. passing explicit argument? Then you, you get a function. <laughs> no, well, yes, but it's probably not the function you expected. So you get some really scary stuff. 
But you see, somewhere in here, you have the isomorphism between uh, binary and unary numbers and so on. Um, yes. So I think, uh, um, yeah, so what, so like when you normalize it, you get something really scary. Okay. But it's pretty easy to understand what this function is doing um, because what could it do? Um, so we haven't really told Agda that we have have a like a smart operation on binary numbers. So what it's really doing is that it takes our two binary numbers, translate them to unary, add them, and then translates back. Um, so uh, so so this is really like uh, oops, now my cat is being uh, very upset. Uh, so it would be something like that's because you're late in your timing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, here's my. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm not going to write this down. I'm just going to say it. So it translates to unary, adds them, and translates back. So this is not always what you want. So. Um, so for a better SIP, um, see uh, this paper uh, internalizing representation independence with univariance that Mathieu mentioned in the beginning. So we have a, have a better version. But here I kind of just wanted to show that with the little stuff I've shown you so far, we can already transport things back and forth between different equivalent types, also structures, and, and compute with them. Now, they don't compute the most efficient way you could imagine, but uh, there are ways to fix that, and we have a paper about it. Um, good. Whew.